CSS is a Comcast charter company. Tennessee Football Classics, Vintage Orange, is brought to you by First Tennessee Bank, the official bank of the Vols, by State Farm Insurance, and the more than 400 State Farm agents in Tennessee who support volunteer football. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. By Ford and your Tennessee Ford dealers, where you'll find quality people, quality products throughout Tennessee. And by Budweiser. Choosing a designated driver is always a good game plan. 1964, Doug Dickey took over the Tennessee program as head coach. His first Tennessee team went 4-5-1. Not much was expected in 1965, but Tennessee surprised a lot of people. Picked to finish ninth in the Southeastern Conference, Tennessee went 8-1-2 and, and wound up with a bid to the Blue Bonnet Bowl. So in 1966, expectations were creeping up even higher for the Tennessee football program. Led by some great names in Tennessee history, Paul Newmoff. The quarterback, the Swamp Rat, Dewey Warren, Austin Denny, and All-American punter Ron Whitby, Tennessee was expected to build off that success in 1965. So now here's a look back at the 1966 Tennessee Volunteers, narrated by the Vol Network's George Mooney. The fans dearly love to watch these exciting Volunteers of Coach Doug Dickey. For the third straight year, as many seasons as Dickey had been head coach, they set new attendance records at Knoxville's Neyland Stadium with crowds averaging 46,000. Another 245,000 fans saw the balls play away from home, including 60,000 at the Gator Bowl. This was Tennessee football 1966. Walking horses provided pageantry at all tennis. And the University of Tennessee marching band expanded to 165 members, filled Tennesseans with pride for its magnificent halftime show. The band has formed its giant T, and here through the tunnel on the east side of Neyland Stadium, Volunteers. They are led by their co-captains and Austin Den linebacker Paul Newmont, who joined two other Tennessee players, center Bob Johnson and punter Ron Whitby, in achieving All-America recognition. Handling the reins of the volunteers, head coach Doug Dickey and a dedicated staff of assistants. Pork chop, meat, mashed potatoes. Now let's get acquainted with these 1966 volunteers. First, the offensive starting unit. The tight end, Austin Denny, co-captain, an All-America from Nashville who set a new Tennessee record for touchdown passes caught. At tackle, John Boynt, a ferocious blocker from Pikeville who has one more season of varsity competition ahead of him. At guard, Charles Rosenfelder, one of an outstanding group of sophomores who played a vital role for the volunteers. Charles from Humboldt was named to the Southeastern Conference All-Sophomore Team. The center was Bob Johnson, an unerring snapper and strong blocker who, in only his junior season, was chosen an All-America. Bob's home is Cleveland, Tennessee. At the other guard position was Elliot Gamby, a scrambling junior from Cedartown, Georgia, one of the most improved members of the squad. Terry Bird, senior tackle from Elizabethtown, Kentucky, one of the smallest linemen, but with a world of heart and an all-out dedication to the game. The split end, Johnny Mills, whose amazing pass catching deeds earned him a place on the 1966 All Southeastern Conference team. John is a senior from Elizabethton, Tennessee. At quarterback, pressure proof Dewey Warren, the fantastic swamp rat from Savannah, Georgia. Dewey was the key to the ball's record shattering passing attack. The tailback was Charles Fulton, an elusive, fast moving junior from Memphis. His credentials included a rushing average of better than four yards a carry. At wingback for the Volunteers was Richmond Flowers, a speedster from Montgomery, Alabama, who worked hard to develop into one of the ball's most sure-handed pass receivers. Richmond was an all-conference sophomore. Fullback Richard Pickens, a sophomore from Knoxville, contributed to the ball running game with a five-yard average. 
the coaches credited Richard's crisp blocking for much of the success in Tennessee's exciting offense. Now here are the members of the starting defensive unit. At end, sophomore from Gates City, Virginia, Neil McMeans. At a most difficult position, McMeans came through with a steady performance week after week. At tackle, Dick Williams from Greenville, Tennessee. Another sophomore whose steady improvement earned him a first team assignment. The middle guard was Bobby Morell, the stubborn senior from College Grove. A determined pass rusher, Bobby also stood his ground against the running attack. At tackle, Derek Weatherford, a junior who combined recklessness with unusual strength in the middle of the ball line. Weatherford's home is in Darlington, South Carolina. The other defensive end was manned by Nick Showalter of Kingsport. The balls benefited from outstanding play provided by sparkling sophomores, Showalter and McMean. The heartbeat of the stout Tennessee defense was Paul Newmark co-captain from Columbus, Ohio. Paul moved from end to linebacker and in only one season advanced to All-America status. Newmoff's running mate, Doug Archibald, a native of Sarasota, Florida. Doug switched to linebacker from Monster Man and gained recognition in the All-Southeastern Conference squad. The Monster Man, Jimmy Glover. This sophomore rover from Lafayette, Tennessee, served capably at one of the most challenging positions on the defensive unit. Harold Stansel completed his third season as a regular defensive halfback. Hal's great speed and willingness to hit made him a nifty operator in the ball secondary. Stansel's home is Knoxville. Another veteran defensive standout, Jerry Smith, a deadly tackler. This Thomasville, North Carolina senior carried out his past defense chores and handled punt return duties for the volunteers. Another prize rookie was Bill Young a Knoxville youngster who moved into the tough defensive safety position and performed his assignments in big league style. It had been precisely six years since Tennessee had last scored a victory over Auburn, and ending the long famine earned first priority as the balls moved toward the 1966 season opener at Legion Field in Birmingham. 57,000 fans saw the late September battle. Tennessee gets a break in the early moments when Tommy Lunsford, back to punt, fumbles on fourth down. The balls take over on the Auburn 16. Warren finds his big end, Austin Denny, on a touchdown pass, allowing the balls to assume an early lead. Junior Gary Wright, place-kicking specialist, boots it over the crossbars. Wright connected on 28 out of 29 extra point attempts during the season and was the ball's second leading score. Rookie Steve Bill Young picks off one of three interceptions made by Tennessee, ending an incipient Auburn drive in the second quarter. Held scoreless for more than 30 minutes, UT cranks up its offense late in the third period. It's Warren to Denny for nine yards. Warren carries for 12 yards to the Auburn 33. A pass from Warren to Mills moves Tennessee inside the Tiger 25-yard line. Sophomore fullback Richard Pickens keeps the drive going with a pickup of nine more yards. It requires four more plays before Husky fullback Bob Moriello opens the fourth period by picking up the clinching yard for Tennessee's second touchdown. And the balls lead 14 to nothing. Doug Archibald adjusting to his linebacker duties falls on a fumble at the Auburn 39 to give the balls another scoring opportunity. Sophomore wingback Richmond Flowers playing before a home state crowd gets eight yards on a pass from Warren. Richmond finds an opening for six more yards, the play carrying to the Tiger 21. The clutch combination of Warren to Denny, which accounted for a record seven touchdowns, strikes Pater two plays later. The 17-yard pass play puts the balls on top, 21 to nothing. UT is playing an alert football game. The balls want this one badly, and Jim Bates pounces on an Auburn fumble at the Tiger 20. Less than two minutes are left in the game when veteran quarterback...
Gallipa loops one over the secondary to end Terry Dalton. It's a glorious 28 to nothing Tennessee victory. The Big Orange's first conquest of Auburn since 1960. Next came a game with an intersectional flavor. The season's first contest at Neyland Stadium before a crowd of 44,000 was against the Owls of the tough Southwest Conference. The inspired Owls were playing their for their revered coach, Jess Neely. The most spectacular play of the game, Warren's arching pass to his wingback, Fulton, catches Rice off guard and picks up 44 yards to the 13. Junior tailback Walter Chadwick falls in a pass. The play good for 13 yards and another volunteer score. Tennessee turns back a stubborn Rice team, 23 to 3. Two of the Southland's great powers met at Grant Field in Atlanta before a sellout throng and a national TV audience. Georgia Tech, combining brilliant passing and running attack, presented a special challenge to the proud volunteer defense. It was a bruising battle and an epic defensive struggle. Gary Wright enters the game and comes through with a 27-yard field goal that puts Tennessee ahead 3 to nothing. With Tech unable to penetrate the ball defense, Bunky Henry again comes on to kick a field goal. This one a 41-yard shot. That is the longest of his career. The titanic defensive battle continues the rest of the game. Tech hands the Volunteers their first loss of the season, 6-3. to three. Defending national champion Alabama brought an undefeated team to Neyland Stadium in mid-October. The largest crowd ever to see a sports event in Tennessee, 56,000 fans, sat through an almost continuing downpour to watch a battle of gigantic proportions and a never-to-be-forgotten fourth quarter. The rain-slippery football pops out of an Alabama back hand and into the clutch of the ball's Derek Weatherford. The big tackle's recovery puts Tennessee in business early at the tie 23. Charlie Fulton switched this game from wing back to tailback, reels off 13 yards to move Tennessee inside the Alabama 10. Warren hits Flowers, but the play only picks up two yards. Denny breaks clear, takes a pass from Warren at the three, and easily steps into the end zone. The Volunteers go ahead, seven to nothing. Whitby, the nation's greatest punter who ended the season with a 43.8 average, keeps the tide bottled up with a 54-yard beauty that Walter Chadwick downs on the Alabama three. Tennessee's attack is in high gear later in the first quarter as Richard Pickens rushes for six yards. Fulton tries the right side of the tide line and breaks through for eight more yards and a first down. The Alabama line stiffens at the 23, bringing a decision to go for the field goal. Gary Wright makes it good from the 40, and Tennessee leads 10 to nothing at the end of the first quarter. An Alabama threat midway through the second period fails to produce any points as Ken Stabler fumbles and Paul Newmark pulls in the loose football. Enjoying good field position at its own 45, gives Alabama its golden chance with a fumble late in the third period. Sophomore end, Mike Ford recovers at the ball 46. This pass from Stabler to Dennis Holman, combined with a penalty against Tennessee for holding, advances the ball 39 yards and moves Alabama all the way down to the volunteer 15. The tide is headed for its first score. On the second play of the fourth quarter, Stabler carries across the narrow Alabama's deficit to two points, 10 to eight, as the tie scored a two-point conversion. 
Alabama mounts a winning drive in the final period, going 75 yards to score. After the tide reaches the five, Tennessee's line blows up, and as these two plays show, halt Alabama's momentum. Steve Davis trots onto the field in a tension-packed situation and kicks the go-ahead field goal. Three minutes and 23 seconds are left, and Alabama leads 11 to 10. There is still time for a Dewey Warren engineered comeback. Bill Baker, a fine sophomore, makes a sensational grab of a pass at midfield. <laughs> Next, former quarterback Charlie Fulton takes a pitch from Warren and passes to Austin Denny, who is filled at the Alabama 13. The play covers 38 yards. Fullback Bob Moriello's power carries the ball to the two-yard line. Only seconds are left in this important Southeastern Conference battle. But Tennessee's game comeback avails nothing. A field goal try on third down is wide to the right, sending the balls down to an 11-10 defeat at the hands of the defending national champion. Now, your first real UT fan shot. The fighting game cops of South Carolina came across the mountains to Knoxville, ready to play a football game. They put forth a gallant effort that tested the ability of the volunteers to rally their forces and come from behind. The contest played at Neyland Stadium counted in SEC standing. The balls trail 11 to nothing when a break late in the second period gives them a chance to get back in the game. Newmont recovers a fumble at the Gamecock 36. Fulton sweeps in for 10 yards, moving the ball to the 21. On the next play, Warren fires at the sideline to Richmond Flowers at the 14. Richmond tight ropes down the east side of the field and goes in for the score. Warren holding for a fake kick, passes to Fulton for the ball's two-point conversion. Trailing 11 to 8 as the third quarter opens, Tennessee gains possession in Carolina territory when Mike Fair, under terrific pressure from Neil McMeans, throws a pass that is intercepted by Jerry Smith. Richard Pickens advances to the 14 for a 10-yard gain. Then Fulton circles right end and moves the ball to the six. It takes the ball four more plays to get in, but Warren dives across for the score from inside the one. Tennessee goes out front, 15 to 11. playing a strong second half cashes in on another opportunity in the final period when defensive back Carol Stansel's interception gives the ball the ball and stops a Gamecock drive. Three passes account for almost all the yardage in the 78-yard scoring march. Warren starts the aerial fireworks with an eight-yard throw to Chadwick. Warren spots Flowers, and the sophomore wingback gets the ball into Gamecock territory, reaching the 37. On the next play, it is Warren to Flowers again, this time good for 37 yards and a score. South Carolina scores as a game ends, but Tennessee has posted its third victory, a 29-17 verdict in an interconference match. Memphis, site of the memorable 1965 victory over UCLA, turned out nearly 50,000 fans for the Vols' encounter with fast-developing Army. The Cadets, under new coach Tom Cahill, had suffered only one defeat, and that to eventual national champion Notre Dame. A beautiful piece of running by Charlie Fulton produces a score, the play covering 28 yards. The touchdown combined with an earlier field goal by Gary Wright gives Tennessee a 10 to nothing lead early in the second period.
Yanni Mills and all Southeastern Conference end makes a fantastic catch of a Warren pass to move the balls deep into Army territory. Fulton crosses the goal over left tackle, enabling Tennessee to carry a 17-0 lead into intermission. The points continue to pile up in the fourth quarter after an exchange of third quarter touchdown. A 69-yard ball march pays off when Warren finds the range on a throw to reserve end, Terry Dalton for the final 24 yards. Sophomore defensive end Nick Showalter climaxes a solid Tennessee performance by grabbing a deflected Army pass and scampering 43 yards for the game's final touchdown. Tennessee rolls past Army with a fine blend of offense and defense by a score of 38 to 7. Chattanooga, which always feels a well-coached team under the veteran Scrappy Moore, brought a team to Knoxville featuring several standout athletes. This was Tennessee's final game before the closing grind against three traditional conference opponents. Tennessee, unexpectedly behind at the half, 10 to 7, goes to work in the third quarter to get on the scoreboard again. Here, Charlie Fulton rambles for 11 yards. Warren fires to Mills, and the big end just misses in his efforts to cross into the end zone. That's Warren going across for the score that restores Tennessee to the lead. It's now a 14 to 10 ball game. In the fourth quarter, a game marked with heavy rains after another touchdown widens the gap to 21 to 10. Warren hits Flowers for a 13-yard game. Then Pickens finds room for a six-yard advance as Tennessee tries to nail down the decision. Warren climaxes this drive as he lost one to his splendid sophomore receiver, Richmond Flowers for the final score in a 28 to 10 Tennessee victory. Homecoming on the hill brought back thousands of alumni for a game against an Ole Miss team that was typically strong and talented. Every seat at Neyland Stadium was sold weeks in advance. Fans saw a fierce defensive struggle punctuated by occasional offensive flurry. Homecoming festivities were highlighted with a gala downtown parade. Two big plays give the Rebels their first touchdown following the interception of a Tennessee pass. Late in the first half, on the tackle eligible fall, Bob Vaughn hauls in a Bruce Newell toss at the 22. Wingback Bruce Matthews outmaneuvers the ball secondary gets clear in the end zone, and is waiting for Newell's perfectly timed pass. Ole Miss goes on top, seven to nothing. Reasoning that nothing succeeds like success, Warren stays with a winner and fires the touchdown pass to Denny. A shutout is averted as Ole Miss downs the Volunteers, 14 to seven. A regionally televised Kentucky game at Knoxville in mid-November sewed up the bid to play Syracuse in the Gator Bowl. In a series distinguished by surprise happenings, the Ball Wildcats battle produced a rare harvest of football thrill. Midway of the first quarter, Warren completes one for 22 yards to mill. It was the start of a record-setting day for the senior end from Elizabethton, Tennessee. As he does so often when pay dirt is near, Warren looks for Austin Denny for the final three yards, and Tennessee goes out front seven to nothing. Here's a spectacular run back of a punt in the second quarter. Dickie Lyons, brilliant Kentucky sophomore, feels Ron Whitby's punt at his 28. Lyons follows his blockers perfectly and races 72 yards for the tying touchdown.
Later, Kentucky goes for a field goal from the 16. Paul Newmoff finds an opening in the Wildcat line. Starts through to block the kick. Jerry Smith retrieves the ball at the goal and brings it out to the 10. Kentucky comes up with another big play before the end of the half. Terry Beadle's pass is hauled in by Larry Seiple, who carries to the two before he's overtaken by Jerry Smith. Beadle's carries across from the one, but there is a minute and 42 seconds left on the clock, and Tennessee goes to work. Kentucky is looking for the pass but Richard Pickens gets loose on a draw play for 16 yards. Warren to Mills gains 33 yards. At the end of the game, Mills had accounted for 225 yards as a receiver for a new Southeastern Conference record. The payoff comes on a seven-yard strike to Richmond Flowers. The touchdown and Gary Wright's conversion puts Tennessee on top of the half, 14-13. Late in the third period, Charlie Fulton goes off tackle, moving from his 34 to the 48. Pickens, successfully working the draw again, crosses into Kentucky territory. The great speed of Richmond Flowers is evident as a sophomore wingback sensation carries to the 19. The touchdown play, a pass from Warren to Flowers to open the fourth quarter. Tennessee leads 21 to 13 with only 18 seconds gone in the final. The next highlight comes when Mills catches a Warren pass at the 35 and goes the rest of the way for a touchdown. The play covers 72 yards. Setting Mills free is a sensational block by Flowers who comes on like a streak to end the system. Kentucky's last major threat goes down the drain when Bill Young intercepts Beatles' long pass and returns it to midfield. The interception helped preserve a 28 to 19 Tennessee victory over the aroused Wildcats. A big rivalry for Tennessee each year is the intrastate series with Vanderbilt. The Vols went to Nashville looking for a victory that would allow them to take a record of seven wins against three losses into the Gator Bowl game. All Tennessee seniors are present at midfield for the toss of the coin. The Vols waste no time trying to salt this one away. On the second play of the game, Fulton goes for seven yards. Warren gives an example of his versatility by picking up nine yards around left end. This time, the call goes to Flowers, and the sophomore Swifty moves ahead for 11 yards. Richard Pickens, an outstanding sophomore from Knoxville, gains the remaining yardage for Tennessee's first touchdown. Less than six minutes have elapsed. Tennessee advances from its own 44 to a second touchdown, highlighted by this pass from Warren to his top receiver, Johnny Mills. Warren circles end and goes in for the score to put Tennessee on top, 14 to nothing. Warren's pass hits Terry Dalton just short of the goal. The rangy end pitches back the ball to Bill Baker, who crosses the goal, but the ball is ruled dead at the one. The play leads to a third ball touchdown. Here, Warren again skirts end and goes in to score, giving the Volunteers a 21 to nothing lead in the first quarter. <laughs> Sophomore Bill Baker, heir apparent next season to Jerry Smith as a ball punt return artist, dashes 44 yards with a bandy punt on the first play of the second quarter.
Bobby Morell, a Middle Tennessee boy playing his final regular season game, is a terror on defense. After blocking two bandy passes, Bobby chokes off a Commodore drive with a fumble recovery at the 19. Tennessee sweeps 81 yards. Here is a Warren pass to Mills, who moves in for an apparent score. But the play is called back because of offsetting penalties. Undaunted, Warren makes it look easy as he fires again to Mills, whose catch closes out the score. Tennessee routes Vanderbilt 28 to nothing to set the stage for the Gator Bowl trip. Well, hello, Mr. Fried Cat. Tennessee Football Classics, Vintage Orange, is brought to you by First Tennessee Bank, the official bank of the Vols, by State Farm Insurance, and the more than 400 State Farm agents in Tennessee who support volunteer football. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. By Ford and your Tennessee Ford dealers, where you'll find quality people, quality products throughout Tennessee. And by Budweiser. Choosing a designated driver is always a good game plan. So after Tennessee's disappointing loss to the Ole Miss Rebels, the Volunteers bounced back in 1966 with strong efforts, winning against Kentucky and then shutting out the Vanderbilt Commodores 28 to nothing to finish the regular season 7-3. That set up a meeting with Syracuse in the Gator Bowl, and it set up one of the classic moments in Tennessee football history, a dramatic confrontation between Paul Newmoff and Larry Zonka of Syracuse. Dick Stratton calls the plays of the 1966 Gator Bowl. Welcome to Jacksonville, Florida, and the 12 Gator Bowl volunteers battle the Orange Bowl for a full house for 60,000 fans. Tennessee, with a 3 record, brings to Jacksonville a powerful offense. It's directed by junior quarterback Dewey Warren. Strong end co-captain Austin Denny grabbed seven touchdown passes this year. Speedster Richmond Flowers caught 35 passes and scored five TDs. And All-America linebacker Paul Newmoff is the most highly regarded defender in Dixie. Doug Dickey on the left is only three years as head coach of Tennessee, has already taken his teams to two bowl games. Benny Schwartzwalder has been 18 years as head coach at Syracuse. His teams have been Eastern Kings four times, national champs once, seven times in bowl games. Syracuse, with an 8-2 record, is strong on fundamentals, long on rushing. Offense geared to the running of All-America Floyd Little, along with Larry Zonka. There's a 12.15 p.m. kickoff time today on the ABC television network, and here comes Syracuse. Tension is mounting now. Tennessee is ready to go. As the team captains come onto the field, I turn the microphone over to your play-by-play -play announcer. The Gator Bowl 1966, the 22nd annual event bringing together Eastern Power Syracuse and one of the best in the South, the University of Tennessee. Tennessee winning the toss of the coin as a record crowd of over 60,000 gets ready for the exciting Gator Bowl action. Millions more watching as ABC sends the Gator Bowl in color across the nation. Tennessee on the receiving end of the kickoff. Austin Denny on the return. But Denny fumbles. And Tony Kioski recovers for Syracuse. A break for the Orange men early at the Tennessee 38. Down deep, Syracuse on the march. Larry Zonka, the big fullback, is called on first, and he gets six big yards. Make it second down and four at the 32. The pitch out to Floyd Little. Little is hemmed up as he gets inside the 30. The Tennessee line makes a save on fourth down as power runner Zonka is stopped for no gain. 
and the Volunteers from Tennessee take over. It's the first quarter of the Gator Bowl. That's fullback Richard Pickens finding little running room against Syracuse. The fans are seeing bruising line play as Pickens is denied a first down. Gator Bowl first quarter, no score as Syracuse will get the ball back. The nation's top punter, Ron Whitby, kicks to Floyd Little. The All-American from Syracuse has got it. He's upfield for a seven-yard return, but hold on, a roughing of the kicker penalty will be marked off against Syracuse. So Tennessee will maintain ball possession. It's a perfect day for football weather-wise. Just across midfield, Charlie Fulton dashes for six yards for the Volunteers. Here comes tailback Fulton again. This time it's a plus three. Gator Bowl action at its very best. Syracuse and Tennessee in the 1966 edition. Tennessee needs one yard for the game's first first down and Chadwick gets it the hard way. Gator Bowl first quarter, no score. Tennessee at the Syracuse 39. The quarterback, Hall of Famer Dewey Warren. He goes to the air and hits Johnny Mills. And that means a nine yard advance. At the 29 of Syracuse, Warren fakes and carries himself to gain another first down for the Volunteers. Both teams can move the football and Tennessee is proving it. A Warren to Mills pass. On target for a good game. From 14 yards away from a touchdown, Warren aims for Mills. It's off the fingertips incomplete. A holding penalty moves the ball back to the 29, where Warren takes aim again. Austin Denny has it for 19 yards and a near first down. It's third down. Quarterback Warren goes to the air again for the big one. But his toss is off the target. On fourth down, Gary Wright comes into the game. And Wright toes a perfect field goal from 36 yards out. And the University of Tennessee takes a 3-0 Gator Bowl lead over Syracuse. Coach Doug Dickey has his volunteers primed to play wide open. Warren obliges his coach, being on target to Johnny Mills for 12 yards. First down at the Tennessee 42, second quarter. That's Johnny Mills on the receiving end at the Syracuse 49. Southeastern Conference Tennessee on the move as Warren is the field general. His play earned him a spot in the Gator Bowl Hall of Fame. Here's a pass clicking to Chadwick. But hold on, there's a penalty flag on the play. Tennessee called for holding, and that will move the ball back to their own 36-yard line. Long yardage needed. The Syracuse defense pressures Warren and this causes him to throw short of Richmond Flowers, their speedster. Here in the Gator Bowl, Tennessee needs that big play. Third and 16 at their own 36. Warren takes aim, a long one. Austin Denny's got it at the Syracuse 27. It's a 37-yard advance. Three to nothing, Tennessee leading and threatening. Dewey Warren, back to pass but he loses his footing, result an eight yard loss. Second and 18 at the Syracuse 35. Warren tossing and Denny makes a fine effort. But the touchdown bid goes incomplete. Now it's third and 18 for the Volunteers from Tennessee. Long yardage situation, a connection to Flowers at the 22. And the Volunteers are now six yards short of a first down. 
Here comes Gary Wright in the game again. This time, his 38-yard field goal is on the money to give Tennessee a 6 to nothing lead here in the Gator Bowl. Gator Bowl fans have seen plenty of football already. And here comes Floyd Little, gaining a Syracuse first down in the second quarter of play. It's first and 10 at their own 29-yard line. And Allen follows his blockers to the 33-yard line. A touchdown would tie the contest up. Tennessee digs in defensively, and there's no running room for Little. As Nick Showalter makes a nifty defensive play for the Volunteers. Why should you choose a... The Tennessee Vols get the ball back. And Warren has his team on the move again. A pass to Mills. Good to the 27. This, plus a 15-yard penalty against Syracuse, has Tennessee first and 10 at their own 42. A good call by quarterback Warren. Here's the draw play. Richard Pickens racing nicely to the Orange men, 26-yard line. And here, football fans, is a close-up look at the 32-yard gain. Sexy and the Volunteers are first and 10 at the 26. Warren back to pass, but Herb Stecker has got his man for an eight-yard loss. That'll make it second down and 18 at the 35. Warren looking for a fine receiver, Johnny Mills. He's got him. It's a plus nine to the 24. We're late in the Gator Bowl, second quarter. Dewey Warren going for the bomb. A long one to Chadwick, too long, incomplete. Fourth down and nine, with Wright faking a field goal, Warren is up and looking to throw. A fine catch by Denny for a Tennessee touchdown. How about that one? Tennessee owns a 12 to nothing lead. And coach Doug Dickey will have his squad going after two points following the touchdown. But the Warren to Chadwick combination fails. And the score remains 12-0, the Volunteers lead. Coach Ben Schwartzwalter would like his squad to get started. And the Syracuse team is on offense. They'd like to score before halftime. Rick Casada, the signal caller. And he goes to the air. But Tennessee defenseman Bill Young goes high into the sky for a nifty interception. He returns it down to the Syracuse 30. And now hold on for the catch of the game. Don't miss it. Warren to Johnny Mills, who pulls in a nifty one-hander. A sensational grab. But a penalty will take it from the records. What a catch. That really has the fans humming. Illegal use of the hands moves the ball back to the 44-yard line. Tennessee leading 12-0 and wanting more. Warren is having quite a day. And Richmond Flowers makes quite a catch at the two-yard line. With 23 seconds left in the first half, Dewey Warren is the signal caller as they threaten to score. He fires to Flowers for the touchdown. And the men from Tennessee take a halftime lead over Syracuse, 18 to nothing, in the 22nd annual Jacksonville, Florida Gator Bowl. And after that action-packed first half, all eyes are focused on the University of Syracuse marching band. The 
newly selected orange girl at Syracuse is former Miss Teenage America, Carlette Dion. Syracuse Band receives a warm show of appreciation. And now the Tennessee Band. This is truly a large college band, 180 instruments. They travel to Jacksonville in no less than five chartered buses. Let's watch these precision drill maneuvers. This packed house at the Gator Bowl shows the Tennessee band what they really think. It's game time again, second half coming up. Tennessee versus Syracuse at the Gator Bowl in Jacksonville, Florida. The third quarter has been Syracuse all the way offensively, and they want a touchdown. From eight yards away, Zunker powers over for the touchdown. Syracuse controlled the ball for over eight minutes in the third quarter. And here's the touchdown again by Larry Zunka. Gator Bowl score, Tennessee 18, Syracuse 6, and the Volunteers own the football again. Warren threw the air to Johnny Mills, and Mills races into Syracuse territory to the 27. The balls are airborne again, but the pressure is on and Warren tosses incomplete. Tennessee down fairly close, second and 10. A quick pass to Denny is on target. The advance to the 20. The Tennessee team is out to increase their lead here in the Gator Bowl. A pitch back to Chadwick. He's inside the 10, but hold on, he comes loose from the football. It's a Thomas recovery for Syracuse. Third quarter, Tennessee 18, Syracuse 6. And another chance for the Orange Men of Syracuse. Here's Floyd Little off on one of his specialties. He's not hauled down until he reaches inside the 25-yard line. A 54-yard dash, plus... 15 more yards against Tennessee for grabbing the face mask. Syracuse threatening near the 10. The give is to Zunker, who crashes for just two yards. Tennessee line is tough, second and eight at the 10. Floyd Little has running room behind the blocking to the five. The third quarter is history. Tennessee owns the lead, but the men of Syracuse are providing quite a second half battle. It becomes fourth down. Syracuse needs three. Allen will be called on. He's around left end. But Showalter makes another fine defensive gem. A goal line stand by the Volunteers ends the Syracuse charge. 18 to six, Tennessee leading. And they're on offense again. They're playing it wide open. The toss goes to Flowers. Final quarter of play as Walter Chadwick charges for seven yards to the 25. On third down, Tennessee has a drive going. But this Warren pass ends up in the hands of defender Tony Kioski. 18 to 6 Tennessee with a big chance now for Syracuse. From near the 10 yard line, Syracuse has it. With a double handoff, Allen ends up on the carry and the football goes flying again. And Tennessee gets the ball right back. Change of events. At the 14 yard line, first and 10, Warren passes to Flowers who charges across the 20. The volunteers of coach Doug Dickey need less than a yard. And quarterback Warren gains the first down despite the heavy traffic. 
The boys from Tennessee go airborne. This Dewey Warren toss is broken up, however, by the secondary of Syracuse. On third down, another aerial. But the on charging linemen of Syracuse cause an incompletion. And Syracuse will get the football back. They lose little time sending Little on his way. It's a gainer along when near midfield. From their own 47, Tom Coughlin gets the ball into Tennessee territory. Fine run. 18 to 6 Tennessee with Syracuse showing a devastating ground attack. Fullback Zonka crashes for 15 and another first down. First and 10 at the 36. The blocking is good up front. Zonka again downfield for a big gain. Now a nine yard advance at the Tennessee 27. The first down assignment goes to Little. He carries out the order to the 25. Power football all the way. We're late in the Gatorball contest as Syracuse heads Goldwood with Little racing inside the 20. But a penalty nullifies the play. Second and 10 at the 25. It's Little again. A fine cutback move. And he powers his way down to the five. First and goal at the five, fullback Zonker is straightened up with a jarring tackle by All-American Paul Numov of Tennessee. The drive ends with All-American Floyd Little scoring. The second touchdown of the second half for Syracuse. And the score is now 18 to 12, Tennessee leading with little time left. The Orangemen try for two, but their bid fails. And there's not much time left in this Gator Bowl game of 1966. There's All-America, Floyd Little. A last effort to try for the win as Syracuse attempts an onside kick, but Tennessee is alert and recovers as the 1966 Gator Bowl game comes to a close. The University of Tennessee and Syracuse University, again in typical Gator Bowl style, thrill the football fans with of excitement. Tennessee winning the 22nd annual edition of the Gator Bowl in Jacksonville, Florida, 18 to 12. It was a classic moment. Doug Dickey being carried off the field by his players after Tennessee won that 1966 Gator Bowl over Syracuse. It was the building block for two great teams in Tennessee history. The 1967 team won the SEC championship and a share of the national crown, and the 1969 team was also an SEC championship squad. The 66 team was very vital to those two championship squads. Thanks for being with us for this look back into Tennessee football history, Vintage Orange. For the Ball Network, 